Hello there, my very good friends. Andy Murray here for What Culture Wrestling. And in 2020, American professional wrestling faces a sizable dilemma, and its name is Tessa Blanchard. Let's break it down. Impact Wrestling released Blanchard while she was their world champion on the 25th of June. And ever since then, well, the fantasy bookers have been going nuts, speculating on what she might do next. She could show up in the AEW and immediately be one of the best performers in the entire division. And that's no shade on people like Hikaru Shida, Riho, Nyla Rose, Penelope Ford. They're all tremendous. But Tessa's just so well-rounded, man. In fact, I think if you plopped her down in WWE, straight away she'd immediately be one of the best. And that's a division that includes, sorry, a company that includes the likes of Io Shirai, Sasha Banks, Bailey, tremendous world-class performers. And honestly, Tessa, she's right up there. And at 25 years old, she has the potential to surpass each and every single one of them. But the thing about Tessa Blanchard is that while she could show up in WWE or AEW tomorrow and be an immediate boost to either company, in the medium term at least, she might not end up working for either of them. Let's talk about why that is. Impact's embrace of intergender wrestling peaked at the Hard to Kill pay-per-view on the 12th of January this year. That was the night, of course, that Tessa Blanchard climbed the mountain. She beat Sammy Callahan and became a deserving world champion. I think it's kind of hard to disagree with that, beyond whatever biases you may have against intergender wrestling. She was comfortably the most compelling act in the company. She was over as hell. She was extremely popular across the board. So, you know, booking that thing weeks and weeks in advance, months in advance, it made sense. It was the right thing to do and it was a genuinely progressive move and one that should have become a game-changing one, particularly for Impact. But the problem with Tessa's title reign is that it was poisoned before it began. Literally one day before the big win was set to air, Alison Kay, a former cohort of Tessa's, someone who'd shared a locker room with her more than once, tweeted the following in response to Tessa stating that women should support women. Remember when you spat in a black woman's face and called her the n-word in Japan? Was that you supporting women? The audacity of this tweet. And Alison Kay was only the first. We heard from many more including AEW Shanna and notably WWE's Chelsea Green, all of whom corroborated this story and came forth with some more as well. The alleged victim of the abuse of the bullying La Rosa Negra, a Puerto Rican wrestler, came forth herself. She gave a couple of interviews, she uploaded a video talking about it to YouTube and all of these pieces started forming together. But Tessa denied it. She uh, tweeted about it, said the whole situation was ridiculous. That tweet has since been deleted, but she did issue a follow-up statement a few days later, basically saying, I didn't do it. Then, later, five months into Blanchard's world title reign, we got the whole controversy of her leaving Impact as well. She had reportedly failed to submit video content for the shows while she was self-isolating in Mexico. So those tapes didn't show up and Impact grew fearful that the world champion wasn't going to show up for the Slammiversary pay-per-view where she was intended to drop the belt. At least that's what the report said. So they cut ties with her. She was released in late June ahead of her contract expiring anyway and that was that. Having seemingly escaped the behavioural issues of her early career once and for all, Tessa was now mired in them once more, five months after genuinely making history. And reliving some of those old allegations helps explain where we are today. WWE quickly emerged as the frontrunners for Tessa's signature when she was let go from Impact, with TalkSport's Alex McCarthy even going as far as saying that sources had told him that Tony Khan of AEW simply wasn't interested. So a lot of people took this as, well, basically, a done deal. She's going to WWE, right? Well, the problem with that is we've been here before. The 2017 May Young Classic. Tessa was a competitor in that. She's always been a great competitor, even back then, but she wasn't brought in alongside the Shayna Baszlers, the Tony Storms, the Piper Nivens after the tournament. On top of this, she also worked a number of jobber spots in NXT in 2016, so you might think, hey, you know, uh, this is a really easy fit. Of course they're going to bring Tessa in. But they didn't, 
And three years later, we're in the same place. So why haven't WWE taken one of these opportunities to sign her over the years? Well, there's all kinds of stories, and this is technically one for the rumour mill, but there was one from a few years ago uh, revolving around a potential confrontation with her ex-partner Ricochet leading to internal heat in WWE. Tessa has since denied all this but the story has come forth multiple times. That's not saying you should believe it at face value but it's there. People have been talking about it. The Wrestling Observer's Dave Meltzer has reported in the past that attitude issues, his words not mine, had led to WWE passing on Tessa in the past. Now WWE is a company that has shown itself time and time again quite willing to conveniently forget transgressions like the ones allegedly committed by Tessa, but they haven't extended that courtesy to her by picking her up. Now it should also be noted at this point that Tessa's entry into the wrestling business was far from an easy one. There's an attitude in pro wrestling among certain types of people that whenever someone enters with a famous surname and Tessa certainly has that. Her father is Tully Blanchard, her grandfather is Joe Blanchard, Magnum TA is her stepfather. But when these people come in there's always sneering cynics going, eh Silver Spoon you're going to be handed opportunities you don't deserve. But that clearly wasn't the case for Tessa. Uh, the Ringer published a lengthy profile piece on her uh, just last year in fact and a number of people they spoke to throughout this touched upon this including her old trainer George South who revealed that when Blanchard came into the industry in 2014 there were some people in locker rooms who did almost everything in their power to in his words break her. So it wasn't the smoothest transition despite what you might think about her surname and about her lineage and Tessa has said herself in the same piece for The Ringer that going to Japan in 2017 allowed her to figure out who she was both as a performer and a person. And she was dead right, that tour was transformational in more ways than one. Tessa was emerging as a true global superstar with huge, huge potential who didn't look out of place at all in what was then the most stacked women's talent pool in the world. I mean stardom was ridiculously packed with outstanding wrestlers back then. But that tour proved transformational in more ways than one. And just two weeks after this piece by The Ringer came out, so too did the allegations of racism that would have gone down on that very tour. So we're now four months removed from Tessa being released from Impact and she is still a free agent. She has worked just one match for Warrior Wrestling since leaving the Anthem Helmed promotion. Now let's look at a guy like Ben Carter because I think it's an interesting comparison. This guy has looked phenomenal in his AEW appearances but he's only wrestled on national television one time. He is a brand new prospect that people are only just learning from. Yet here we are and barely a day passes without WWE being interested or AEW being interested. Bottom line, that guy's made one appearance on Dynamite and two on Dark and he's already one of the most sought after people in the business. He might even be signed with a company by the time this video gets uploaded. The key point with this is that the free agent market, the talent market in pro wrestling in 2020 is insane, it is ravenous. Promotions are desperate to grab anyone who has even the slightest bit of buzz and that's no disrespect to Ben Carter by the way, I think the guy is absolutely tremendous. But compared to Tessa, he's been around for five minutes. The dude has literally worked three AEW matches to complement a growing indie resume. Tessa was a world champion for what is still a major promotion at the beginning of the year and yet here she is. She's not getting these same rumours as Ben Carter every week, she's sitting on a shelf gathering dust when she should be the hottest free agent in the world by a landslide. History tells us that professional wrestling organisations will forgive all but the absolute worst transgressions. Hey look, the ultimate warrior with his history of vile, disgusting, homophobic remarks, he even made his way back into WWE. Tessa is in a different situation but a difficult situation nonetheless. In all likelihood she will find her way into a major wrestling promotion in America before long within the next couple of years and hopefully that will come as a result of looking at these experiences as objectively as possible. Scaling everything up, learning the appropriate lessons and demonstrating this in a public setting. That is the most important part of all. These controversies will always be part of Blanchard's legacy but they don't have to define her legacy. At 25 years old she has time on her side and yes, 
I do believe that she can atone and rebuild that reputation. For now, however, Tessa may be better off looking abroad. Mexico is a real option here, not only because her husband-to-be, Daga, is a Mexican wrestler with experience all across the Lucha Libre circuit. It's also because that scene just doesn't get a lot of coverage. It's really undercovered when it comes to English language media. Recovering, rebuilding her reputation, learning these lessons and growing as a performer away from the attention of wrestling media, away from that spotlight and that microscope might just be the ticket, might just be the platform she needs to rebuild. Because, at the end of it all, Tessa Blanchard is a once-in-a-generation talent. I believe, personally, that she has the potential to be one of the best wrestlers in the world, regardless of gender. But she's got to take those steps. We've got to get rid of this unsavoury reputation, and that means some serious atonement. She can't be a pariah forever, because if she does, she's never going to hit her peak. But anyway guys, that's it. My take on the matter is done. And as always, I want to know what you think about the situation. Let us know where you think Tessa's going to end up and when that might happen. Once you've done that, don't forget to like, share, subscribe and ring the bell for notifications. Then you can follow us on Twitter at WhatCultureWWE and myself at AndyHMurray where you can tell me how wrong I am. Goodbye.